the theater. We all love it. Want to hear from someone who is destined for high achievement before they get famous? Want to watch an up and coming local success story? Well, this episode is for you. Come walk in the rain of a creative brainstorm. Welcome to Northern Vibe. Thanks very much for tuning in. I'm Matt Maloney, host and founder of Northern Vibe. We are about sharing stories. This is where discussions are held with interesting, informed people to gain their perspective on any issues that cultivate curiosity, curiosity, both ours and theirs. Northern Vibe is where the meaningful is revealed. And this week, I've got Amber Grosman on. Now, this young lady is someone to watch. Now, please like and share. We are growing, but we need your help to keep up momentum. We're getting some very interesting locations. And uh, looking this week, I've got a... Uh, I've got a place, it's here called um, uh, Melbourne, Melbourne. Oh, I don't know, it must be somewhere down south. I've never kind of really heard about it. I wonder who owns the, who owns the pub down there, but uh, g'day to that little town of Melbourne. Uh, thanks very much for tuning in. Look, ask questions, make comments. We've got some great suggestions from the comments pages, so please keep them coming. That includes suggestions for guests, indeed, if you're interested in coming on Northern Vibe, contact me uh, through the Facebook page. The reason I've been lucky enough to secure Amber was through a guest suggestion. So uh, if, if you throw it in, you'll probably come on. Now, Amber is an up and comer and I'll be doing a brief intro, but first, we always have a mention in dispatches to a charity that are doing good work. And this week, a big shout out to Amber's favorite charity, Red Cross. Amber, um, tell me a little bit, tell me what you like about Red Cross and what they do. The Red Cross is a beautiful charity. Um, most people know them as the blood donor people um, and they're close to my heart because my mom is immunosuppressed and she relies on the generosity of plasma donors to continue living a happy and healthy life. Um, so we're very grateful for everyone who donates plasma and indeed blood. Well, uh, I'm proud to say actually that um, I occasionally give blood, although I am overdue, they send me a, a, a very disappointed, you know, when you <laughs> Of like when your teacher sends that I'm very disappointed in you, Matthew. That's the email that I got from the Red Cross. So I'm, oh no, tut tut. <laughs> well, no, I will. I'll go down and give them. I'll go down and give them some Maloney Claret. I've got no problem with that at all. <laughs> but Amber Grosman is an up and coming young lady. She's got a great skill set, um, and she's demonstrated competence across a number of activities. She's a Cairns based playwright. She's a director. She's a teaching artist. She's worked with some of Queensland's most prominent theatre companies including the Young Theatre Company, Jute Theatre Company and Queensland Theatre. Amber is the proud recipient of two different RADF grants. She's sponsored by the Cairns Council and Queensland Government, both in 2019 and 2020, so very recent. Amber is super passionate about delivering quality arts and education and opportunities to students in regional and remote Queensland. Considering that Northern Vibe started off as a uh, new state, uh, new state, podcast where we're very, very interested in ensuring that the regions have uh, have uh, have a voice uh, that especially warms my heart, I've got to say. Amber, thank you for coming on. Hi, I'm very excited to be here. Hello, everyone. Um, obviously, I'm Amber Grossman, um, and I am the CEO and director of my new theatre company called Overall Arts. I'm not donning my overalls today, but I do have my beautiful little overall arts badge. <laughs> So, mate, that's um, uh, yeah. Well, look, uh, I'm kind of tempted to uh, I'm tempted to dive right into the overall tragedy situation, but uh, I know people really do want to find out uh, find out a little bit more about uh, the, the other side, and you know, we all have a secret uh, that's like that. And your overalls wearing uh, your overalls wearing thing that's that's safe with me and the uh, thousand odd viewers also. Oh, there is no secret about it. I love my overalls. I think if you're going to see me 90% of the time, you're going to be like, oh, it's that overalls lady. She's she's at it again. <laughs> well, you know, Winston Churchill used to love wearing overalls. I'm a great fan of Winnie. Um, and uh, he used to call them his rompers. So you're in <laughs> I right, love that. Tell, no, tell us about yourself besides the overall wearing thing. Please, we want to hear about Amber Grosman. Well, um, I am 19 years old and I graduated from St. Andrew's Catholic College in 2018. So I am fresh into the workforce. Um, I'm currently studying a Bachelor of Education secondary at JCU. Um, and I also work at St. Andrew's as a dance and drama assistant. 
um, on top of obviously managing my own company, writing some plays, doing some shows, all of those sorts of fun things around the track. So um, my end goal is I would like to be a drama teacher, both in schools and out of schools, focusing on the regional areas, because I think that as a regional place and in regional and remote, remote locations, we have got so much to offer. Um, and I'd like to you know, find that talent and hone that talent in regional areas. Oh, absolutely. And, um, you know, we, you're right about the regions. We simply don't get the love, you know, we, um, we deserve, uh, uh, and if we had control of our own resources and be able to decide a little bit more about what we can do about ourselves and what we want to do and be able to promote ourselves a little bit more, I, I suspect you'd get uh, more of the love that, that you deserve. But having said that, considering that you're 19, um, I can say with some degree of confidence, I, I know that we're going to be hearing from you and you're, Actually, I, I don't know if you're aware of this. Your mother teaches my middle daughter, Zalia. Yes, yeah, we were just having a chat about that last night. My mum is also a teacher at St Andrews. Um, she's a beautiful lady, an incredible woman, and she's a, bit, a big she inspiration is. of mine, especially in the world of teaching. So I'm very lucky to have her um, as a good inspiration in my life. Um, and yes, she often, when I, when I meet new people, I've often got some sort of teaching connection through mum as well. <laughs> Well, um, you know, your mother hasn't just inspired, uh, sorry, your mother hasn't just inspired you. She's um, inspired my daughter as well. And uh, my daughter has a bit of a link, uh, a link about the artistic, but we're here to, um, we're here to, we're here to find out about you. So look, let's start off on your play. You're 19 years old. You've written this play. Uh, Knowing Me, I believe the uh, title is. Yeah, so Knowing Me is actually the second uh, play that I've written. Um, uh, it's the second work that I've produced um, on a professional stage. Um, so Knowing Me started off as a bunch of these kind of stories that I've collected over the years. So it's called, uh, it's a monologue show. So it's a show that's created through a bunch of different monologues. Um, and those monologues, I wrote them uh, a couple of years ago um, in between throughout high school and the last monologue was written this year. So there are a bunch of stories that I've collected over the years, obviously dramatized a little bit to keep them interesting. Um, and then I decided to put them together um, and create them into this work called Knowing Me. Um, yeah. And the kind of way that Knowing Me was written and the way it's been produced is that uh, the, the work is set in an art classroom after COVID. So these students have come back to school not knowing what to expect. They're really not wanting to be at school. They feel scared. They feel unsafe. They're really, really um, traumatized from this whole experience. And so they decide that the best thing that they can do is play up for their art teacher who just all she wants to do is just deliver some art and they just, you know, they're throwing paper at her and they're, you know, calling out and calling their names, which is really nasty. So she puts her foot down and decides, you know what, we're not going to have a lesson today. You guys just go ahead and paint your feelings. And they're all like, oh, paint our feelings. That's really lame because it has a little bit lame. <laughs> But then they go ahead and they get into it and that's where those stories come to life through the artwork that they've created on stage, um, which was actually created by our lovely local artist who I believe was on the show, Hayley Gillespie. Indeed. And uh, yeah, she was thrilled and I mean thrilled to be in, involved in, in that project and, and that little artistic pocket rocket. If she decides that something's going to happen, it, it's going to happen. And I, yeah. Look, I really, really, I've been so blessed being able to speak to two people. That's one of the great things about Northern Vibe. Yes, I get to promote what's going on up here. Yes, I get to have these excellent discussions, but I get to, I know it sounds corny, but I get to meet people like you. I mean, I get to meet people like Haley, David Hudson, these other really just amazing, talented people. And they, they've just kicked bottom. It's, it, it, it's, kind, of, it's kind of awesome. So yeah. what's, tell me one of the quick stories, your favourite story in the Knowing Me story. Oh my goodness. I'm actually going to bring up a photo for the audience so oh, that they okay. can yes. have a look because um, I think the best way to explain it is through um, this photo that I have. So let me just pull that one up, share screen. I will share this screen. Uh, here we go. Oh, where are we? Yeah. Hello. Can we see? Oh, there we go. Share. Awesome. Can we see this picture here? Uh, I'm getting a small group. Oh, there we go. Here we go. There we go. Can we see it now? Not quite. Okay. 
Now, full production. Oh, okay, bigger eyes. Yes. Wait, can you put yes. more? Uh, I probably can. Uh, right, yeah, view action size. Uh, I'm not sure. I think I'll just leave it that. No, that's, size, that's okay. That's, that's okay. okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, talk, so talk this. Yeah, this was the set of Knowing Me. Um, obviously, you can, you can see all of the students who are on stage are my actors. So they look disengaged. As I told you, they were being quite naughty for their teacher. Um, so each of these paintings is based off of uh, a monologue that I wrote um, that's part of the show and Haley created. So the creation of those paintings um, was through a process of um, this incredible sort of uh, therapeutic energy where we went into Haley's art workshop and she ran the workshop and each of the students was asked to get into character within the first hour and they stayed in character for the next hour and a half. So within that time they stayed in their character and they painted what they thought their character would paint as their character. Um, and then Haley collected all of those students artworks and produced the artwork that you can see on the stage. Um, so uh, I suppose this one here uh, is a story about a young man who discovers that his roommate is not the person that he believed he was. So the doe represents um, lost innocence in a way um, and, you know, being reveal revealing secrets. Um, so this, that was probably one of my favorite monologues that I, I wrote as a short story in year 12, so two years ago, that um, kind of progressed. So I think that one was my favorite. Um, that young actress, her name is Beatrice Holloway. Um, and she's a very promising talent who will, uh, you know, be coming up in the future, I'm sure. <laughs> oh. Great. Well, that's absolutely thrilling. And I'm kind of, uh, do you want to go through the other ones or? Yeah, I mean, why not? <laughs> that one was my favorite. Um, but the, the painting back here, actually, so this lovely lady who is playing our teacher, her name is Liz Christensen, Christensen oopsies, um, and she is a prolific actor and a playwright herself around Cairns. Um, she's a huge inspiration to me. Um, I have worked on some of her projects and, of course, directed her in this project of mine. Um, and the artwork, which you can't really see back there, is actually my own artwork. Um, so Haley oh. said to me, um, you know, you're an artist. We'll put one of your paintings in the show. Um, so that was the last painting to be turned around. So um, each of the paintings was turned around as the stories were told. So the set was this evolving and changing kind of creation as each of the stories were told. Um, and the last one that the audience got to see was my, my artwork. So I was very, very pleased about that. Um, yeah, uh, so that was that one. Um, and this one here was about a young woman who was really deeply affected by the coronavirus. Um, and so that story was kind of really loosely based off of my experience with my mom who has um, an immuno condition, talking about how um, viruses such as, you know, the, pan the, glo the global pandemic that we've just been through um, can be uh, a lot more scary for people who um, are suffering in different ways that we don't normally see. Um, and this story here, this young woman at the back, her name's Betty and she's a lovely young actor. Um, her story was actually the hardest to write because it was a story that um, I kind of came up with. It was one that wasn't really uh, you know, wasn't inspired by true events. I just thought, you know, what would be something really dramatic to happen in a monologue? Sure. So this young woman, um, her dog followed her down to the beach and she was really angry and grumpy. So she threw a stick into the ocean and the dog, you know, jumped into the ocean to follow the stick and got caught in a rip and drowned. So <laughs> that was a really hard story to write, but um, the audience was really um, impacted by that story and um, the emotion that the young actor was able to bring to it, um, which is what all of these monologues were written for as a way to make a social comment about things that are going on in society that these young people are really passionate about and that I'm passionate about. Um, and also as a way for these young actors to express their emotions and to um, 
really explore what it is to be an actor with material that's really meaty and a way to sink their teeth into this material that's not just, you know, your everyday, oh, hello, hello, how are you sort of yeah. script, yeah, you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, sitcoms. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Look, if I can make a really quick comment, and I'm going, I promise Absolutely. the 70 30 thing, and, uh, you know, a couple of my uh, thanks for the feedback is it 70 30, Matt. Uh, the coronavirus thing is so true. Like last week, I interviewed Alan Clough, who's a very, very well respected epidemiologist. Now, um, he, he didn't want to discuss COVID too much because he goes, Matt, it's, it's outside of my area of expertise. I'm an epidemiologist, but he does um, alcohol and suicide and stuff like that. Now, um, we don't have the actual stats yet, but there has been a spike in suicides and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, I can't say, no one can say at this stage that it's related to COVID, but it's, there's a distinct correlation at this stage. And the other concern that I raised with, um, with a good professor when I, was, when I was talking to him, and he's a brilliant man, and he did, which is something I found reassuring, he kind of agreed with me. He goes, I said, you know, I'm concerned that, when we're just dealing with this one problem, we're unwrapping the we're unwrapping the solutions to all these other problems. Mm. The breast cancer tests, you know, they're, they're not getting they're not getting you know they're not getting the cancer checks. They're not getting this this sort of stuff because all these resources were being put into COVID. And for complete clarity, like I'm not a COVID anti vaxxer. Like I, yeah, no. I think that that was a serious disease and it needed to be needed to be looked at. You know, there are thousands of people dying in, in places there. And my cousin, who's the head of the spinal unit, ringing me up and going, "Mate, it's serious." Uh, that that's pretty compelling. Mm. But, you know, we um, cure disease. Uh, There's the whole issue with that. But anyway, please move on. Tell us. Yeah. Tell us. I'm intrigued no. about these other ones here. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with you, though, Matt, um, in terms of coronavirus um, uh, creating or not really creating, shedding a light on all of these different issues, um, especially for young people. Um, a lot of what we dealt with in the script um, and in the rehearsal room with these young actors was how they felt isolated um, and impacted upon, you know, what kind of damage does being isolated from friends and family and getting uprooted from your regular routine, what kind of um, impact does that have on a young person who, you know, is potentially already struggling. So there was a real um, focus on the mental health and the well-being of these students. And we were just so lucky to be able to go through with the program um, and the show because this was the first show to kind of hit the camp stages after COVID. So we were really lucky in that sense as well. Well, it wasn't so much lucky and so much as hard work. If I can make the observation, <laughs> Amber, because, um, you know, I've, I've done a little bit of creative work myself without going into precise details. And, um, you know, I had something, I've had a couple of things published. And a friend of mine said, oh, you're so lucky. And I went, no, no, <laughs> like, like you pick eight random numbers and you like six and two supplementaries and someone gives you $60 million. That's lucky. It's like, no, like sitting down, sweating your guts out and like staring at a blank, blank page and, you know, pouring your heart into it. That's not luck, man. It's like hard work. Um, but I, 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 actually, you know what, we've got... Look, yeah, we've got the time. Let's dive in. Well, what were some of the things that the young people were saying about COVID? And, and you know, what was the kind of take on that? Because, you know, we, we're not allowed to go to, um, I, can, I can also say, I, I've had a lot of dealings with Indigenous people and um, up in the tablelands, I was speaking to a group of Indigenous people about the COVID response and, and the, uh, the group of people I was speaking to were, were, were Christians. And I said, you know, we can't go to church. Yeah. But, you know, we can't go to church and, and it wasn't just church. Like we can't engage in other cultural activities that we kind of do. You know, we can't, our dance group, our, our dance group can't get together. You know, we can't get these sorts of things. And people didn't think it mattered, but you know what? It turned out that it's the very fabric of society itself. Like it mattered and it mattered much, you know? Yeah, it, it does. It matters so much. Um, for these young people, obviously, um, by the time we got to the rehearsal process of the program, um, they had been back at school for a little while, but not too long. So for them, they were coming into rehearsal going, oh, I'm so exhausted. I've been, I've had to jump back into this routine of going back to school. Um, and I suppose we talked a lot about the impacts of Zoom actually, um, and learning about like having to engage young people 
from my side of the fence, having to engage young people for hours at a time over Zoom, um, trying to teach drama and teach creativity through a computer screen um, for weeks on end was crazy. And for them, trying to stay engaged in what we were doing and trying to stay engaged with their teachers, whether that be their drama teacher or their regular teacher, through that computer screen, they found that to be really fatiguing um, in terms of, you know, their emotional well-being as well as the actual physical fatigue of Zoom, which some people have reported as a, as a thing about, you know, having the headaches and just sitting at the computer screen all day. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, no. It's, it's really it, it, interesting. Yeah. Well, I mean, what, yeah, it's the, the, that's... And I'm so kind of glad that they're feeling the same sorts of things that quite, quite frankly, I was. And move on to the next, um, before we move on to the next thing, I, this is incredibly geeky, but I, I, I suspect that you and I share a bit of a geek vibe here. So I'm, I'm going to. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I started reading a Canterbury, uh, Canterbury Tales again. And, you know, of course, yeah. Well, it's set in plague times. Yeah. And I first started reading Canterbury Tales years ago and I only got through a, a couple of stories and it's just because I've got so much to read. Mm. Now that I've gone back to it, because it starts off in a pub, okay? They're all meeting on this pub to to go on a, you know, to go on a religious trip, basically. And I kind of like, I didn't get it. Now, um, you can see the excitement. I'm really getting, I'm really getting it from the version of someone, not who's gone through the plague, obviously, because the Black Death was a, a bit of a different COVID, but, different. <laughs> um, but, but it's like, these people were isolated, and they were just happy to talk to and this idea that it was kind of scurrilous to get together and talk in a pub and then they were going to like all get together it's like well have you got the plague have you got the plague and they're going to check each other out yeah. then they're like going to go on this oh and and then all these different social casts yeah it's so cool so uh, you know hey read a canterbury tales if you're out there listening like you know it, you you'll get it post covid you will understand a canterbury tales like we would have never have got that before it's so interesting to see how, as a society, we may think we're so far removed from our ancestors, but, you know, we're really not. We may have evolved with our technology, but um, with our physiology, our psychology, who we are as innate humans, we're still the same people. Yes. And <laughs> that's it. We have different kinds of masks, not the beak plague masks anymore. And that's it. That's so true. Because, like, <laughs> I, I mean, you know, I, I, I have these discussions all the time. People say, oh, things are so different. I go, well, okay. But let's talk about Zoom. It's just a different form of communication. I mean, is it amazing? Yes. Um, is it something that our ancestors could have never conceived of? Yes. But what is it? It's a form of communication. But yeah, we're still using it for the same purposes of yeah, writing it's, a letter. It's, it's human beings doing human being stuff. Like, we, yeah. you know, the, the, the human condition has not changed. But please, tell me more about some of these. Um, yeah, well, actually, we're halfway through. But, you know, it's, yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> I know, I know. Goes so Not, quick. Um, no I suppose for me, um, the human condition, writing about people, uh, and that is what I do. That is what I love. I love to watch people. I love to hear about, I hear stories, like storytelling is so innate to how people are in today's society and how, you know, we've always been, we're storytellers. Um, and that is what I love. I love telling stories. I love watching people, seeing reactions. Um, theater is a, a way to comment on society. It's a way to share your voice. It's a way to make people feel things. Um, and that is what I love, um, regardless of what stories I'm telling, whether they're for teenagers or adults or children um, in any kind of medium, that's what I love to do is to tell the stories um, and to make a comment. Um, and to make people feel things. So, yeah. You brilliant, you brilliant young lady. What was <laughs> you? Pardon, sorry? Because well, we're going to, like, I, I do, if we have time, we'll come back to the pictures. But tell me, what yeah. inspires you? What inspires me is the, I suppose, I just, I'm inspired by people, but not necessarily like, you know, I'm inspired by Leonardo da Vinci or this person or that person. I'm inspired by behavior and circumstance. I love to, I'm the kind of person who will grab a cup of coffee and go and sit by myself in a cafe and just watch the people around me um, going about their day-to-day -day lives. Like you can tell so much about a person just by the way they sit and scroll on their phone or they sit and drink a cup of coffee. I can create stories for them, whether or not they be even remotely true. Um, just 
the people around me inspire me to create stories that they want to hear and that I want to tell, you know? Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> I'm also very inspired by, shall I close this um, image? <laughs> um, yeah, if you want. Yeah, no worries. I can, um, I'm also inspired by a number of Australian playwrights, um, particularly in the style of my writing. Um, Nick Enright, who wrote an incredible play called Black Rock back in the day. Um, it came out in the 90s, I believe, and it was the story of a young woman who was unfortunately murdered in a small town um, after she went to a big party. Um, and that play uh, is an incredible social comment on the way that teenagers were treating women um, and other young and other their peers back in the day. Um, and also the way that they were engaging with each other. Um, and the comment that that particular play has made and the reach um, and the change that it created was incredible. And that is what I aim to do one day with one of my works is to create a social commentary and to create um, a national conversation surrounding some of these issues that I'm really passionate about. Oh, cool. So what sort of issues, obviously, besides COVID? Tell me. Um, my particular thing that I love <laughs> to write about um, and talk about all the time. I'm a huge advocate for young people. Um, children and young people are so much more multifaceted and multidimensional than we give them credit for. Mm. Um, young people have these complex, rich inner lives that are so often dismissed by the structures of their lives, such as schools. Um, and they have these incredible outlooks on life and things that they're so passionate about, particularly this generation. Um, and I love to write theater that reflects that, um, that portrays teenagers as people who are passionate and kind and complex, um, and also give those teenagers roles to play that are that kind of way instead of you know oh you're playing Betty and she's just obsessed with her phone and likes to hashtag tweet all the time yeah, yeah. yes teenagers do like to hashtag tweet all the time but that's not all they are you know yeah and look really that's been the entire trope of pretty much every adult and child book really when it comes right down to it I mean if you look at the most kind of relatively recent ones uh you know Harry Potter the entire kind of that was such a deep one. She's she's brilliant, J.K. Rowling. Oh but yeah. Kind of what that was about. It's like, hey, there's a lot going on on the surface there. There. You go back through the famous five. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the. the oh yes. <laughs> yeah, five. I love it. Oh my god, you know the famous five and all those kinds of other books and Roald Dahl, arguably <gasps> the greatest. Yeah, the greatest. Of all time. He said, "I prefer writing for adults. It's easier because uh, the kids, the kids, they are, they are the toughest ones." And getting into that that deep psychology but you think of Matilda you think of all of his books it's about it's like adults are kind of dumb kids kind of like know a little bit more what's going on you know this this uh this archetype I suppose really is the only only word that I can really uh really use that kind of what in, encompasses that and Matilda especially you know arguably one of his most famous books but James and the Giant Peach it's got a touch it's of so good <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Well, uh, on him, you know, Roald Dahl used to tuck himself. He had a he had a routine with writing. Okay, what he used to do was he used to go to his like little writing den, and he had a den, fucking devil, and he used to like tuck himself in, like um, like he had a blanket. He tuck himself in pen and paper, and he'd sit there and typewriter, so he couldn't easily get up. Like, do you oh have? Some Pardon, sorry. Do I have I'll a sort of? Process? Do you have something like that, like a little ritual that you kind of do, like he? He'd get his tea, he'd tuck himself in. He'd like, right, I can't move. There's uh, something to nibble there. And he'd like, do it. It was like, boom, I'm in the zone. That's it. Don't disturb me. I'm, I'm in the zone for the next few hours. But it was that little ritual that he had for himself that got him into the zone. You got anything like that? Yeah. Um, every time I have a new idea that seems quite promising, I either buy or use a really nice notebook <laughs> that I need to fill up like that. That is my project notebook. So, um, you know, that's my knowing me notebook or that's my one second notebook. And I have to fill that notebook. <laughs> I'm really um, old fashioned in the way that I handwrite all of my drafts of my plays and stories before I type them up 
because um, I find that my ideas flow the best when I'm able to just like scroll them out and I can read them on paper instead of like I find sitting down to a computer screen um, just fresh off the bat with you know no ideas just staring at that little cursor blinking at you going oh my goodness I don't know what to write but in a blank page there's so much opportunity even if I just want to scribble or move my hand and do whatever on the page it's creating something that will then you know my brain will eventually start to spew out some kind of cool words <laughs> so um you can read your handwriting clearly <laughs> yeah I'm a, <laughs> yeah, yeah I can't read my handwriting either. yeah <laughs> you know I had a I have a high school teacher as a mom so um I'm very lucky to have uh developed that handwriting skill because that was beaten into me when I was young you know neat handwriting <laughs> <laughs> all right um well you know we've covered off on a number of my questions there um and you've but besides theatre, what else do you get involved in? You don't have to show us any of the pictures, but I, I know you've been involved in other things other than theatre. Yeah, well, I am also a visual artist. Actually, that is where my arts practice um, in terms of all of that sort of stuff started off. Um, I was drawing as my parents say, for before I could properly write. I love to draw, um, I love to sketch. My predominant medium is watercolor. Um, actually, a lot of my ideas for my plays, once I've kind of observed these behaviors and have you know a brief idea in my head, I like to draw the characters before I, um, before I write them down because I feel that when I'm drawing them, I can really get those nuances of who they are as a person before they become alive on the page, they're already alive on this, you know, particular canvas or this particular notebook, they're there, I can look at them and look into their eyes. I know it sounds like really, you know, funny, but I can look into their eyes and see that they're alive before I can create what they say. No, see that's, uh, again, that's animation though too. See, the, uh, the thing I love about the, you know, the, the Latin root uh, of the word animation is, um, is to be alive, is to be alive but in an animal sort of way. Um, they, kind of, they kind of believed, and this, there's a lot of discussion about this, but they kind of believed that animals were animated in so much as they were alive, but they didn't really have spirits. So, oh. yeah, I know. Uh, and there's a lot of discussion about that too, and it depends on which religious thing you look at, you know, the Stoics or whatever it is. Um, but look, what makes, what makes good theatre for you? What makes oh. good art? Like, no, let's broaden it. What makes good art? What makes good art for you? Um. I would say good art is any art that has been created through passion. Anybody who is passionate about what they do and decides to put it out into the world, I would I would, I applaud that um, um, massively. You know, I my biggest kind of advice that I was ever given is draw badly you know, sing off key, create mediocre theater and just keep going and keep going and produce work. And one day you will find it um, that you've improved. And one day you'll find that your passion is just through the roof enough that you've created something that other people are passionate about too. Well, it's very Jordan Peterson. I don't know if you're familiar with his work. Yeah, yes. Very, yeah. Very, the... very Jordan Peterson, yeah. And uh, hi, if I can make the, you know, this is the Catholic coming out of me, but uh, hi, mate, you know, the uh, the old Greek word for, for sin. You know, people got this idea that sin, and it's because, no disrespect to my Protestant friends who, who are watching, and I know, but especially the kind of like more, um, I've actually got an American friend who tunes into this and he's, and he's, he's quite vehement. But like, um, you know, the, the, we, we, we've, we've really been sort of like this, this idea of hell and sin has been taken over by this idea of fire and brimstone. Um, and of course, that's not the way it was. The, the ancient Greek word for sin is haimate, which is an archery term, as you know, from listening to Jordan Peterson, which means uh, to fall short of the mark. Hmm. All concept behind that is, and, and if you think of it, so it, it means that sin isn't, it's not so much evil, bad, burning in hell, although there is, there is evil. Like I'm not arguing that there is yeah. evil. I'm, I'm not of that theology, but it's about taking aim at something and falling short. And that's not always a bad thing because you've taken aim at something. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like to Absolutely. fall a mark means you've got a mark. Yeah. You're going for something. So that's kind of, okay, you've fallen short. Let's work a little bit harder. You, you get, sooner or later, you're going to hit that target. So yeah, absolutely. Works and you really, you think about it, that concept works on every level of life. 
It's not just the moral side. Like there is kind of like, and I think you'd agree with me. And tell me if you don't, by the way, I'm really no, happy. No, absolutely. I'm not here to be validated. Um, you can you, you can have artistic sin. That is, the, you've fallen short. You know what I mean? It's like this, yeah. I write some stuff and I read it later. And go, <laughs> no, scrunch up, throw yeah. it. It's artistic sin. You know what I mean? I've fallen okay. short. Mark. It's just not that good. And I had to screw it up, throw it in the bin, take, pull out another arrow, take it again. You know what I mean? At, at, at the target. Does that kind of yeah, like- it really does. Actually, I used to do the same thing whenever I wrote a piece that I was like, oh, what is this? <laughs> like, this is donkey. This is <laughs> terrible. Or, you know, I'd draw something and the nose would be half the size of the face and I'd be like, oh, oh my goodness, she does not look very pretty. Um, but recently I have been keeping those things. Like in the past couple of years, I've decided I'm going to keep all of those things. I'm not necessarily going to share them with other people, but I'm keeping them for myself as a validation of I did it. I did something that I'm passionate about. And also as a validation of um, to be able to look back on and go, I've really improved. So I kind of value those things um, as, you know, as a way of learning. That works, that, that works on so many different levels. And that's, that's precisely the concept. And I'm sure that that's, I'm sure that's what St. Paul and Christ himself meant when they, when they, when they talked about that concept. I, you know, I, I genuinely mean that. And I, I, I don't, lightly. it's like, you know, you, you have a kind of look at that. And in fact, I've got one bit of work that's, that, that's, that, um, and I won't go into the precise details. Like I wrote it when I was really angry about uh, a person and a, and, and a thing and not only was it badly written, but it was like like it was kind of nasty. You know what I mean? It was like it's yeah, a, like revealed a part of me that I always knew that was there. I actually keep that. Like I, I I've kept that because any time like I start getting the you know I, I look at it and go yeah you, you just you remember that's who that's who you are, that's who you are. Like yeah, have you done these great things? Have you hit the target a few times? Yeah, you have. But that's not all you are. You know you're <laughs> you're more than that. You're also a dirt bag who kind of did this, your arrow has fallen short on more than one occasion, man. Like you've created a lot of, and in that particular one, not only was it artistic sin, there was actually a degree of moral sin about it as well. Wow. Um, yeah. So anyway, but yeah. uh, you're not, like you're not inclined to share any of your other cheesy grin work, Ooh. any of your paintings or anything like that? Um, I don't, I. You, you, you haven't got them ready? I do. I actually have a portfolio just over here. Let me grab some. <laughs> Could you grab that? Please. Thank you. I knew this would be good. I knew this would be good. I'll just hold them up in front of the camera. Yeah. Oh, can we hear? Yes, we can. Cool. Is there anything um, out there? So I uh, recently, actually, before I show some of my other artwork, I have been um, creating a mural for the council that is getting put up um, around the scaff- around some of the scaffolding in the city. So I've got this huge um, piece of plywood, I think it's three meters by two meters or something that I've just been painting over the past week or so um, that's going up around the city. So I'm pretty excited about that. Although I'm not gonna show any photos of that one because it's not done yet. (laughs) And I'm I'm very protective of my process sometimes. (laughs) But- um, Hey, could you stop the share? That might make it a little bit easier. Yes, that would be easy. And I've had a couple of comments too. It's like oh, people are okay. enjoying our conversation, but we need to stop. <laughs> Perfect. There we go. Done. We go. All right. So um, this is probably more, more the style that I relate to these days. So this is an example of one of my watercolour portraits. Hang on. Oh, my God. Right. Yeah, so um, these are my watercolor, this is an example of one of my watercolor portraits. um, And that is the predominant medium that I work in, portraiture and um, watercolor. Who is that? Um, Creation of my imagination. (laughs) Mm. Uh, I'm sure one of the guys is gonna put up, is she single, the person? (laughs) Oh. (laughs) Um, Mr. Mr. Brandstrod. And then sometimes I go into a more experimental style. Um, For example, this one, um, which is more, uh, so for this technique, I put all the water on the page and then I dropped the ink into the water to create some of those um, effects. Um, And 
these sorts of um, really emotive pieces are sort of the ones that I kind of use as a basis for my writing. So if I'm feeling a particularly really strong emotion or a connection to an idea, I'll paint something that's got a lot of emotion behind it and kind of use that as my basis. Mm. Yeah, so I've got that one there. <laughs> right. Who is it? Can you tell us or just? I don't have, uh, none of my paintings are actually people that I know. I've, I've very rarely ever painted somebody that I know. Um, yeah, I've always just painted it off my imagination. Right. Yeah. Um, let me see if I have another one. Oh, this one is a good one, actually, um, in terms of story. <laughs> uh, oh, well, it's, it's actually good in terms of art, too, actually. <laughs> Thank you. Um, not um, done, but that's, that's why that's why I have observation, not flattery, I assure you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this painting is uh, quite obviously quite similar to the others in terms of portrait. Um, but this uh, particular woman is a character in one of my shows. Um, her name is Adrian. So in the show that I wrote in 2018 that got produced in 2019 um, called One Second is a teenage show about the dangers of drink driving. So it's a romance where these two beautiful young teenagers, you know, they fall in love with each other. They're not sure like, you know, does he like me? Do I like her? All of that sort of stuff. Anyway, they go to this party um, and one of the, the one of the young men decides he's going to drive home. Nobody stops him, and unfortunately, he dies in a car accident. Um, so this is the young woman who fell in love with that um, boy who died um, in the play, and her name is Adrian. Um, and she kind of came to life before the before it was written. Um, and so this was one of the paintings that I did. Uh, actually after the show as like a bit of a storyboard um, but yeah she was alive in my mind before that oh my god well there's a country music song there I promise <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, that was uh, a show that I wrote actually when I was a teenager um, back in 2016 that I've actually developed over the years and, and was produced as a full-scale production last year so some of the original words that I wrote when I was, you know, 14 and 15 were still in this show, um, you know, altered and edited to make it sound a little bit better <laughs> now what? that my vocabulary's grown. But yeah, the idea came when I was much younger. Well, can you tell us about some of your other plays? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, oh, actually, no, um, sorry, is there more art? Oh, I can see a pork. I can see oh, <laughs> there, there's a little one bit more. more. One more, one, one more. One more. I'll show you a different sort of one. Um, I recently, so this was a uh, kind of experimental piece that I did. Oh, I'm um, sorry. Yeah, it was, it's a little bit weird. I did it as a draft for a painting um, that I got commissioned to do by um, one of my clients. And the, the, the canvas was, um, I think, two meters by one and a half meters. So it was this huge canvas that this kind of um, style of all the, you know, the, the paint that gets layered and brushed on and then the overarching sort of um, silhouette. Yeah, so that was done as a little draft for a bigger painting. Wow. Are you familiar with a bloke named, and Haley uh, and I discussed it, bloke's name is, and Google him, I swear to God, you'll love him. Bloke's name is Owen Cyclops. Obviously, that's his artistic name. Oh. <laughs> right. he's, he's almost as good as you. Oh, stop it. <laughs> I, I'd go that far. Owen Cyclops, is that his name? Yeah, C-Y-C-L. Yeah, obviously, that's his artistic name. Yeah. But, um, oh, wow. Yeah, I know. Uh, uh, after, after the interview, Amber, after the interview. <laughs> I did a little speaking. I just had to know. <laughs> <laughs> your adoring public awaits, okay? So, so, tell me, so tell me about your other projects. Um, so, other plays. Yeah. yeah, so Good I project. told you about One Second. Um, I'm thinking of doing a reproduction of One Second next year with a, um, with a young cast. So the cast that I did that, that was in One Second in 2019 was a mixture of students who were still in high school and also um, young actors who had just finished high school. So um, my kind of goal for the next stage of this particular play is for it to be produced um, 
by obviously myself, but to be acted by a whole bunch of young people who the story is actually aimed at um, so that it becomes really quite relevant as well to that age group. Mm. Yeah. Well, that sounds pretty cool. Yes, I've also got um, a couple of new ideas that are bubbling below the surface at the moment for another play, um, which again is aimed at teenagers and through experiences of my friends and myself in high school. Um, and that is all about navigating um, relationships in high school um, with your friends and with um, potential partners and how important it is. It's kind of a bit of a feminist sort of um, writing about how important it is to stay true to yourself as a young woman and not to get too um, attached to your particular partner and to stay um, an individual regardless of your circumstances. Yeah, well, um, you know, if my wife had have seen that some time ago, I'd assure, you know, we're probably, I probably would have never got married. Uh, <laughs> thank, thank God we can't go back in time for that. And really, oh, no, no. It's, really, it's, that's that, that poor woman's only fault is bad taste in men. But, uh, <laughs> I disagree. <laughs> yeah. oh, oh, no. All right. Well, we're actually, mate, we're, um, mate, we have flown through the time. Um, oh. Actually, well, mate, we've pretty much, is there anything, well, is, is there any other, like, okay, so theatre, you, you've got that as well. Do you do any writing? Are you a writer as well? Yeah, well, um, I do most of my writing that I do is um, obviously for the for the stage, so playwriting. But I started off as um, a short story writer and as a poet, um, which my poetry is probably the art form that I keep closest to my chest. Um, I think it's the most probably the most raw form of writing is to express yourself through poetry in my humble opinion i'm um, so tempted to i'm so tempted to twist your arm right now but <laughs> oh no well, would, you, would you read one come on oh uh, yes i will let me okay. let me try and find one. Let's do this. come on i just i've got to open up my google drive to try okay. and all right. Here we Wait. go. Oh no, I can't believe you twisted my arm. <laughs> you don't even remember it. You wrote it. Come on. It's me. Oh no, I know. I um I'm too nervous to remember it now, but um I just recently performed this one in a uh in a poetry slam as part of um a can the Cannes Festival. Um Do it. Here we Do it. go. So, <laughs> here we go. Watch out for the strange men that you don't know lurking in the shadows with their smiles that make you clutch your keys tighter and walk a little quicker and wish that you'd actually bought the pepper spray when your mother had told you that a woman disappeared on the beach last week and you're numb, a little afraid, but God knows that good girl don't, <laughs> God knows that bad things don't happen to good girls like you good girls who know to look out for the man in the shadow. And you are a good girl, you know that for sure, because that's what the boy who wiped away your tears told you when he pried open your legs. It was all just a game, a fun game that adults play a little fun. Keep your eyes down, keep your mouth shut. Don't tell your mum. But that's not the same. The same as the girl who disappeared on the beach last week. That man was a shadow. Surely it's her fault she had to know. How dare she walk alone on her own, leave her home? The only dangers are the ones on the outside, on the streets below, don't you know? And don't you dare look too closely at your brothers and your cousins, your uncles and your lovers, because you might see a glimpse of the shadow man in their eyes, of the shadow lingering between your thighs where he touched you. They scream at me in the streets, tap me on the shoulder when I speak. Hem, it's not all men, not all men. I know that, I'm not daft, but someone tell me how many and how many will cross my path. When femicide is rampant and men kill women in their homes, it's not all men. That's a good one, trust me, I would know. But then the crime comes devastatingly, unexpected. He would never, but he did. And the blame is then deflected. So look me in the eyes, tell me you'd let me walk home alone tonight. Take a moment, take a stand. You know that something here is not right. Ooh. That's <laughs> so, really cool. Thank you so much. 
Thank you. Um, I just want to put it out there that uh, that is not a personal story. Um, that is a story that I wrote um, based off of a um, stimulus called Write a Revolution. So the obviously we were chose to write a revolution about something we were really passionate about. Mm. Yes. <laughs> well, actually, the last um, yeah, the yeah, I actually no, I can't, I can't say that because the matter is still before the courts. But yes, I do know of a job just like that. Um, as, you know, I've just come out of the Queensland Police Service, as, as I'm sure you're aware. But yeah. Um, yeah, my last big job just before I came out was a job rather like that one, but the matter's before the courts, so I really shouldn't comment. Um, mm -hmm. Coming up to the, we're really pretty much <laughs> the hour. So mate, I might do the outtake and um, we might pretty much wrap it up. Like, unless there's anything else you want to add, look, is there anything, um, when's the next time, you know, is there anything you need to plug? Like, when's the next time we your work when's the next you know can you can you tell us about that yeah so i am in the process of writing for a grant um a, a uh, state grant called the raf people <laughs> they are a beautiful wonderful um organization who gives out money to artists like me to distribute around the community and to use accordingly um so i will be putting out some um information in the next year about the next young creatives mentorship program <laughs> Here we are, Young Creators Mentorship Program. Mm -hmm. um, and that is the program um, which I have six or seven um, young artists who come um, under a residency and work with me um, and a whole bunch of different artists from the Cairns region over a three or four month period. And that is when we produce um, our main stage shows, um, such as Knowing Me, which you guys all saw the picture of before. Um, so yeah, that is what's coming up soon. We will be having that um, those auditions in the next year year for our next batch of young creatives to come through to work with myself and a whole bunch of other artists who we have um, from the Cairns region. So yes, um, and you can hear all about what we've got coming up um, on overallarts.com. Um, that is the website and also head to Overall Arts on Facebook and Instagram. I post um, a weekly update of what's been going on around Cairns um, in terms of the art scene, what I've been involved in, what other young creatives are up to. Um, it's a great way to stay informed and also a great way to support me. <laughs> well, and deservedly so, and I'll be, I'll be putting all the relevant links, the likings and the sharings and all that sort of stuff. So please keep that on Northern Vibe and keep an eye on Northern Vibe as well, because I assure you, like I said in the beginning, we're going to be keeping an eye on, <laughs> on this oh. very, this magnificent up and coming uh, young talent. But look, uh, we've pretty much, we're coming up to the hour. Uh, I'm really, really excited. I, I do have some more questions, but I'm going to show a little bit of self-restraint, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and not, not go too much past the hour. Look, great interview. Thanks very much for talking to us, Sam. Seriously, it was it was just a magnificent pleasure. To everybody out there, and we're getting a few, we're getting a bit of love uh, already on the Facebook page, but please like and share. Like everyone's got to know about this young lady and you want to be able to say, hey, look, I knew about this girl. <laughs> this girl before she was famous, okay? You know, I, I knew all about her. And every Wednesday, my colleague, uh, David Young, does an excellent podcast on Podbean. Yes, for North Queensland State. Wednesday nights between 7 p.m. and 8 p.m. Get the Podbean map. Have a listen. Uh, also, there's a really interesting online talkback show, High Humidity. It's, uh, again, new state-based with Nettie and Bunny online. Search them on Facebook and tune in. Next uh, next week, Monday, the 7th of December, we've got Keely Johnson on. Oh, my God, she is so inspirational. You might remember her uh, for my regular listeners. She was the golden octopus. We actually had her on as a charity. So she's, she's again, this magnificent multi-talented woman. She's running a charity. She's a cancer survivor. She's, uh, she's a, a great country singer. She's done some fantastic performances as well. So again, she's someone else who's got talent on a, on a whole bunch of different levels. We're, we're lucky enough to have her on next week. I'm really excited about that as well. So um, uh, please tune into that and uh, give Keely, uh, sorry, and give Amber some love as well. Anytime you see any of her plays out there, Go and see them. I'm, I, you know, I'm a great believer in, in the art scene and I get out there as often as I possibly can. So, look, Amber, I'll just get you to stay on just for one second while I, uh, while I, end, the, while I end the recording and everything. But thank you very much to everybody. You. You know, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I do. As you can see, I've got a couple of tech issues going on here. I am going to get some better equipment uh, going on. So that's, the, um, that's a little bit of professionalism that I, I know we've got to tweak. 
I'm chasing some sponsors actually. So if there's uh, anyone out there that wants to sponsor us and get us some uh, uh, better equipment, so I'm using something better than my equipment. That'd be, uh, that would be absolutely fantastic to have you on board. Thank you very much. Do tune in next week. Amber, you're a dead set legend. Um, st stay on mate. And I'll talk to you off.